Hello, everybody, and welcome to part two of the Apocalypse of Abraham. If this is your first time joining us on this channel, welcome. I'm so happy that you are here. However, I would suggest before listening to part two, please go back and listen to part one. In part one, I give a brief history of the Apocalypse of Abraham as a missing book of the Bible, and we read through the first eight chapters of the Apocalypse of Abraham, with which consist of part one of the book, which was Abraham leaving behind his religion of birth, which was more of a polytheistic religion. Now, once again, every Tuesday from 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I do go live on the Dark Outpost platform. There is a link to David's Dark Outpost in the description box below. If you would like to join us for the live readings of these banned books, then you are welcome to actually call into the show. If you are not on the Dark Outpost TV platform, you can also catch the Dark Outpost on both BitChute and Rumble. And then, of course, on Wednesdays, I do a recap of what we read through the day before. Now, as I said in part one, I am very interested in doing a comparison episode between the book of Abraham that's found in the Pearl of Great Price coming from the Latter-day Saints Church and this particular book. From what I can tell in my research, these are two separate books, but might very well tell the same story since it's involving the same biblical character that is the character of Abraham. Now I myself did not grow up in the Mormon church. I have read the Book of Mormon just for my own interest in learning what other people believe, but I have not read the Pearl of Great Price nor have I read the Book of Abraham that is in the Pearl of Great Price. So if anybody out there listening is experienced with this material and wants to join us in a roundtable discussion comparing the two manuscripts, then please email me. My email address is down in the description box below. Put Abraham in the subject line and I will send you the PDF file of the Apocalypse of Abraham for you to read so that you can compare it to the Book of Abraham in the Pearl of Great Price. Once more, thank you so much to all of my patrons and my producers. My film equipment is being a little fickle today, so I won't be able to put your names up in the credits today, but I appreciate you so, so, so much. For those that are joining the Patreon community, please know that usually videos are submitted into YouTube about a week before they air for you. This is because of all these censorship guidelines and we want to try to keep this channel up as long as possible as we move through this great awakening so once you become a patron or producer usually it takes about a week for your name to appear on the credits that's simply just because of the schedule in which we're submitting videos in for the approval of YouTube so that the channel's integrity and content remains protected but I, I appreciate all you guys so, so incredibly much. I literally don't know where we would be without our patrons and our producers. And I am looking to do a Zoom hangout with all of our patrons coming up in the next couple of months. I am trying to figure out the Zoom application to see if I can have that many people on my package at the same time, or if I need uh, better equipment to bigger a uh, monitor or screen in order to do that and as you all know as I said before I am trying to save a percentage of the patreon money to buy better equipment to have a bigger monitor so I can release more videos out to you guys and I'll be able to host more people on a zoom to be able to then do meetups and hangouts with all of the patrons and producers off the air so I thank you so much with your patience uh, with that. I will be reaching out to all the patrons in the next couple of months to try to schedule that. All right, let's get started with part two. Part two is labeled the apocalypse. And remember guys, apocalypse just means to lift the veil. We spoke about this with David that, at least for me, we've been programmed to believe that apocalypse means something like disastrous is gonna happen, but it actually just means to reveal. 
you know, the apocalypse of revelation. It's just to reveal the truth, to lift the veil. So Abraham is now understanding that there is one source creator, one God. And so he's having his own apocalypse where the veil is being lifted and he is seeing the truth, which again, Abraham is the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So Abraham receives a divine command to offer sacrifice after 40 days as a preparation for a divine revelation. Then a voice came to me speaking twice, Abraham, Abraham, and I said, here I am. And he said, behold, it is I, fear not, for I am before the world and the mighty God who hath created the light of the world. So we often see this in the Bible as well, that whenever an angel appears or in this point, God appears, it is first, the first thing that these, these beings say is to fear not. We see this all over the Bible. Don't be afraid because you know, I know, like if I were to see, and I have seen stuff before, but if I, a great angel were to like appear, a bright light were to appear in front of you, you'd probably be trembling with fear. And we are going to see Abraham be a little bit afraid. And so the first thing these positive beings, whether it be an angel or God himself say is fear not, don't be afraid. He also says that I am the creator of the light of the world. And if you guys remember back, uh, we've been covering these missing books for a while now, and I can't remember exactly which gospel it was that we covered. I think it was one of the Gnostic gospels where we learned that the word light in Hebrew was a little bit different than the translation of light in English. Like when it says, God said, let there be light, at least in my head or the way it was taught in my church was the sun, that there was light for us to see. But the old Hebrew word for light would have meant a divine spark, the light behind our eyes, this divine spark that is within the animals, the divine spark of consciousness, the anointment of consciousness. And so when it says, and a mighty God who hath created the light of the world, I believe he's talking literally about our divinity, our divine, our soul, our divine spark. I am a shield over thee, and I am thy helper. Go, take me a young heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a pigeon, and bring me a pure sacrifice. And in this sacrifice, I will lay before thee the ages to come, and to make known to thee what is reserved, and thou shalt see great things which thou hast not seen hitherto, because thou hast loved to search me out, and I have named thee my friend. But abstain from every form of food that proceedeth out of the fire, and from drinking the wine, and from anointing thyself with oil for forty days. And then set forth for me the sacrifice which I have commanded thee, in the place which I will show thee on the high mountain." And there I will show thee the ages which have been created and established, made and renewed by my word. And I will make known to thee what shall come to pass in thee on those who have done evil and practiced righteousness in the generations of men. Before we read further, I'm going to flip now to my Bible, actually, to Genesis 15, because this is actually in Genesis 15. And when we look at debating whether these books are heresy or not, I think it is important to look back at the canonized Bible, what we have, and see the, the, the correlations between the stories. So this is Genesis 15, God's covenant with Abram. Because again, at this point, his name is Abram, not Abraham. We spoke about this last week that in the apocalypse of Abraham, he is calling himself Abraham because he's speaking He's telling us this story. And also, even though at this point his name isn't Abraham, it's Abram, we have to understand with the English translations, there could have been a place where the person translating just left the name Abraham because that is how we know him, if that makes sense. So Genesis 15, God's covenant with Abram. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. We just read that in the Apocalypse of Abraham. So it's the same thing in Genesis. But Abram said, O so sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? The one who will inherit my state is Elzir of Damascus. 
And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said, So shall your offspring be. We also saw this exact reference in the book of Jubilees, which we just finished reading. And we see lots of indications of stars and learning how to read the stars, which again, Abraham was an astronomer. He read astrology. I know a lot of Christians don't want to hear that, but that is not demonic. That was the, the smear campaign against astrology and astronomy came during World War II during the Hess Act, which I've spoken about a lot. It was basically Nazi propaganda. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about that in this episode because I've already spoken about that a lot at length. But a lot of these people in the Bible that we venerate in the Bible were astrologists, were astronomers. They, they knew how to read the stars. And Abraham believed the Lord and he created it to him as righteousness. He said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to take, to take possession of it. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. So he's asking for the same sacrifices in Genesis as he is in this quote-unquote heretical book of the Bible. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down to the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated four hundred years. But I will punish the nation they were to serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out of this great possession. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried in a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun has set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed in two pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kinesiites, the Kedemites, the Hittites, the Preziites, the Rephiites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Gergashiites, and Jebuites. So this whole episode that we're about to get into in the Apocalypse of Abraham is spoken about in the book of Genesis. However, the details that we're going to get into with the Apocalypse of Abraham are not in the Bible. Now, could this mean that Genesis, it was taken out of the book of Genesis during the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century when the Bible was first edited? I don't know, possibly. But it also could mean that it wasn't put in the book of Genesis because Moses, the writer of the Torah, also had the Apocalypse of Abraham, this book that was supposed to be in the Torah and in the Bible as well. I don't know which one is accurate uh, over time. We'll just have to wait and see what is revealed once the Vatican Library has been opened to us, the public. So now we come to a new section. Abram, under the direction of Angel Joel, proceeds to Mount Horeb, a journey of 40 days to offer sacrifice. So let's talk about Angel Joel for just a second. Now the spelling is J-A-O-E-L. Some people might call him Joel. From my research though, I did do a deep dive into Angel Joel just so I understood who this angel was historically, biblically. Um, and most people refer to him as Joel. Now, Joel is considered to be by many people an archangel. Now, an archangel is a chief angel, and archangels are only mentioned twice in the New Testament. They're mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and in Jude 9. Most Protestant churches only talk about archangel Michael being like the only main angel, but we also know there's Gabriel and Raphael. Now, in Jewish literature, the book of the Tobet, which I know last week I said the next book we get into is going to be probably Jacob's Ladder, but I think we're actually going to do the book of to Tobet first, um, just so we have more of a foundational understanding of this Jewish literature before we proceed into more of these missing books. We hear Raphael refer to a 
group of archangels. So in Tobet 1215, he says, I am Raphael, one of the seven angels who stands in the glorious presence of the Lord, ready to serve him. We also see the reference of seven archangels in the book of Enoch, which again is another band book we've spoken about a lot, which we will eventually get to. Now this is interesting because in numerology, seven means hidden mysteries or inner wisdom. And we know mysteries is just hidden information. Of course, angels, especially archangels with, with the ability to heal people who are the closest to God would have hidden mysteries. We also know this counters the seven deadly sins. So in my opinion, it makes sense that there are at least seven archangels and not just one or two as in Michael and Gabriel, but Michael and Gabriel have five other, potentially five other archangels that work with them, maybe even more. We'll see as we get deeper into these missing works. So in the Apocalypse of Abraham, we're now seeing Angel Joel, which according again to the book of, of Tobit and the book of Enoch, he was just like Archangel Michael and Gabriel. He was an archangel, one of the real big heavy lifters of the angelic host created by God. All right. And it came to pass when I heard the voice of him who spake such words to me, and I looked hither and thither, and lo, there was no breath of man, and my spirit was affrightened, and my soul fled from me, and I became like stone, and fell down upon the earth, for I had no more strength to stand on the earth. So basically, he had a panic attack when he saw this angel, which I probably, or God and this angel, which I probably would too. And while I was still lying with my face upon the earth, I heard the voice of a holy one speaking, Go, Joel, and by means of my ineffable name, raise me yonder man and strengthen him so that he recovers from his trembling. So after Abraham has like basically had a panic attack because he saw God, God is sending Archangel Joel to heal him, to help him understand and to guide him along these revelations that are going to come to Abraham. And the angel came, whom he had sent to me in the likeness of a man, and grasped me by my right hand, and set me up upon my feet, and said to me, Stand up, Abraham, friend of God, who loveth thee. Let not the trembling of man seize thee. For lo, I have been sent to thee to strengthen thee and bless thee in the name of God, who loveth thee, the creator of the celestial and the terrestrial. Be fearless and hasten to him. I am called Joel by him who moveth that which existed with me on the seventh expenses upon the firement, a power of virtue and the ineffable name that is dwelling in me. Now, interesting, he picks him up by the right hand, and we spoke about this last week, that we're going to see the seeds of Gnosticism in this book, even though this book would have been in the Old Testament, and we see the development of Gnosticism in the beginning of the New Testament. We know that Gnostics, the inner knowledge of Gnosis versus Edio, the outer knowledge, was crucial in the crux of the original Christian groups. They were more interested in Gnosis and inner knowledge. That's why they were called by historians Gnostics. Now the church again will tell you that the Gnostics were heathens and heretics and and don't listen to them, but we know that the church is super corrupt. Not saying again that your pastor is corrupt, just the organization as a whole is corrupt and for over a thousand years has been teaching false information in order to infiltrate the narrative, which we now understand in this great awakening. So we see the right-handed path, which was the gnosis of the pure path, the path of God, where the left-handed path was the path of Lucifer. So this is Joel, I am the one who hath given to restrain according to his commandment, the threatening attacks of the living creatures of the cherubim against one another and teach those who carry him the song of the seventh hour of the night. I am ordained to restrain the Levethian for unto me are subject the attacks of menace of every single reptile. Interesting, the menace of every single reptile. This is the first time I'm reading this section to you guys and we know a lot about that now, don't we? I'm beginning to understand why the uh, Canaanites, as in Constantine the Great, decided to not let people read this book. I am he who hath been commissioned to loosen Hades, to destroy him who stareth at the dead. I am the one who was commissioned to set fire to thy father's house, 
together with him because he displayed reverence for the dead idols. I have been sent to bless thee now and the land which the Eternal One whom thou hast invoked hath prepared for thee and for thy sake have I wended my way upon the earth. Stand up, Abraham, go without fear. Be right glad and rejoice, and I am with thee, for eternal honor hath been prepared for thee by the Eternal One. Go fulfill the sacrifices commanded, for lo, I have been appointed to be with thee and with the generations prepared to spring from thee. And with me, Michael blesseth thee forever. Be of good cheer and go. So here we have reference to Archangel Michael. And I rose up and saw him who had grasped me by the right hand and set me up upon my feet. And the appearance of his body was like sapphire and the look of his countenance like chrysolite and the hair of his head like snow and the turban upon his head like the appearance of the rainbow and the clothing of its garments like purple and gold specters was in his right hand and he said to me abraham and i said here i am thy servant and he said let not my look affright thee nor my speech that that thy soul be not perturbed Come with me, and I will go with thee until the sacrifice visible, but after the sacrifice invisible forever. Be of good cheer and come. And we went, the two of us together, forty days and nights, and I ate no bread and drank no water, because my food was to see the angel who was with me, and his speech that was my drink. And we came to the mount of God, the glorious Horeb, and I said to the angel, Singer of the Eternal One, lo, I have no sacrifice with me. Nor am I aware of a place of an altar on the mountain. How can I bring a sacrifice? And he said to me, look around. And I looked around and lo, there were following us all the prescribed sacrificial animals, the young heifer and the she groat and the ram and the turtle dove and the pigeon. And the angel said to me, Abraham, I said, here I am. And he said to me, all these slaughter and divide the animals into two halves, one against the other. But the birds do not sever, but give to the men whom I shall show thee standing by thee, for these are the altars upon the mountain to offer sacrifice to the eternal. Now, interesting, he in Genesis 15, he lays out the sacrifices in the exact same manner. That's interesting, isn't it? But the turtle doves and the pigeon give to me, for I will ascend upon the wings of the bird in order to show thee in heaven and on the earth and in the sea and in the abyss and in the underworld and in the garden of Eden and in its rivers and the fullness of the whole world and its circle thou shalt gaze them all. Now I want to say, so the glorious Mount Horeb, I did some research into this and some people believe that Horeb is also Mount Sinai, which is the mountain of God. Other people say that Mount Sinai is in the area of what was Horeb, and so many people refer to Mount Sinai as Horeb, but it was Mount Sinai. But basically, at the end of the day, what I've learned is this mountain that Abraham is doing his sacrifices on is Mount is basically the same mountain as Mount Sinai, where Moses would, many generations later, receive the Ten Commandments and the Book of Jubilee, as we covered in our last missing book of the Bible. I also want to go back and mention that when Archangel Joel was introducing himself to Abraham, he spoke about the gates of Hades and the cherubim who were fighting each other he's referring to what happened with the nephilim and the watchers so the watchers were also angels that came down to help mankind this is a story that is kind of brushed over in churches there's some references to it in the bible but not many this is the giants and they became the spirits of the demons Anyway, most of you guys listening to this are aware of what I'm speaking about because we have covered the Nephilim on this channel and we've talked about what happened when we reviewed the book of Jubilees. This is also a crucial crux point of the book of Enoch, which again we will eventually get to. It was very, very well known that the Nephilim were here on this earth and that the Watchers were manipulated and basically turned against God. And that's basically why the flood happened with Noah. So Abraham would have been aware of this story as one of Noah's descendants. So this brings us to chapter 13. Abraham accomplishes the sacrifice under the guidance of the angel and refuses to be diverted from his purpose 
by Azazel. And I did everything according to the commandment of the angel, and gave the angels who had come to us the divided angels animals, but the angels took the birds, and I waited for the evening sacrifice, and there flew an unclean bird down upon the carcasses, and I drove it away, and the unclean bird spake to me, and said, What doest thou, Abraham, upon the holy heights, where no man eateth or drinketh, neither is there upon them any food of man, but these consume everything with fire, and will burn thee up. Forsake the man who is with thee, and flee." For if thou ascendest to the heights, they will make an end of thee. And it came to pass, when I saw the bird speak, and I said to the angel, What is this, my lord? And he says, This is ungodliness. This is Azazel. And he said to it, Disgrace upon thee, Azazel, for Abraham's lot is in heaven, but thine upon the earth. Because thou hast chosen and loved this for the dwelling place of thine uncleanliness. Therefore the eternal mighty Lord made thee a dweller upon the earth, and through thee every evil spirit of lies, and through thee wrath and trials for the generations of ungodly man. For God the eternal mighty one hath not permitted that the bodies of the righteous should be in thy hand, in order that thereby the life of the righteous and the destruction of the unclean may be assured. Here, friend, be gone with shame for me, for it hath not been given to thee to play the tempter in regards to all righteousness. Depart from this man. Thou canst not lead him astray, because he is an enemy to thee, and of those who follow thee and love thee willest. For behold, the vesture which is in heaven was formerly thine, hath been set aside for him, and the mortality which has his hath been transformed to thee. So Azazel, I did a little bit of digging into Azazel before recording. All an archangel, the seducer of mankind from the book of Enoch. Azazel also is used in the Jewish tradition of Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement. So in the old Jewish tradition of Yom Kippur, two goats were picked for sacrifices. One was sacrificed for the God of Abraham, and the other was actually sacrificed for Azazel. And the um, rabbi would place all the sins of the Jewish people on the goat that was going to be then given to Azazel. So this goat was literally, literally the scapegoat in Yom Kippur. So I just thought that was super, super interesting. All right, this takes us to chapter 14. The angel said to me, Abraham, and I said, Here I am, I thy servant. And he said, Know from thenceforth that the Eternal One hath chosen thee, him who thou lovest to be of good courage, and use this authority so far as I bid thee against him who slaughtereth truth. Should I not be able to put him to shame, who hath scattered over the earth the secrets of heaven and hath rebelled against the Mighty One? Say to him, Be thou the burning coal of the furnace of the earth, go, Azazel, into the inaccessible parts of the earth. For thy heritage is to be over those existing with thee being born, with the stars and clouds, with men whose portion thou art, and who through thy being exist, and thine enemy is justification. On this account, by thy perdition, disappear from me." And I'd uttered the words which the angel had taught me, and he said, Abraham, and I said, Here I am, thy servant. And the angel said to me, Answer him not, for God hath given him power over those who do answer him. An angel spake to me a second time and said, Now and said, Now rather how much he speak to thee, answer him not, that his will may be no free course in thee, because the eternal and mighty one hath given him weight and will, answer him not. I did what was commanded me by the angel, and however much he spake to me, I answered him nothing whatsoever. So basically, this we saw this in the book of Jubilee, where he was called the Prince Mesima in the book of Jubilee. And when Noah was kind of talking to God about like the problem with these demonic Nephil uh, Nephilim spirits being left meant that the same corruption could happen again. And God basically said, I am going to basically jail keep captive 90% of the demonic spirits, but I'm going to leave 10% of them out because there is a purpose for evil. And that purpose many people believe is our own free will. And in this, we see that Archangel Joel 
is telling Abraham that don't answer Azazel, even though you are seeking the one true God, Azazel ha does have power. He will, he will answer your call. And knowing what we know now about Luciferianist and Satanist, it, that is very interesting to me that, yeah, he does. And I've said that before, like Satan is way stronger than any human being, right? This is a super battle between God and Satan. And so you, if you do pray to Satan, he will be there to service you. The only difference is, is when Satan gives you something, he expects something in return. Whereas God does not. God is the God of life. Satan is, is the God of death, basically. All right, so here we go. Chapter 15. Abraham and the angels ascend on the wings of the birds of heaven. It came to pass when the sun went down and lo, a smoke as a furnace. And the angels who had the portions of the sacrifice ascended from the top of the smoke furnace. And the angel took with me the right hand and set me on the right wing of the pigeon and set himself on the left wing of the turtle dove, which birds had neither been slaughtered nor divided. And he bore me to the borders of the flaming fire, and we ascended as with many winds to the heaven, which was fixed upon the surface, and I saw on the air, on the height to which we ascended a strong light, which it was impossible to describe, and lo, in the light a fiercely burning fire for people, many people of, of male appearances." all constantly changing in aspect and form, running and being transformed and worshiping and crying with a sound of words which I knew not. And I said to the angel, Why hast thou brought me up here now? Because I cannot see, for I am already grown weak, and my spirit departeth from me. And he said to me, Remain by me, and fear not. And he whom thou seest come straight towards us with a great voice of holiness, that this is the Eternal One who loveth thee, but himself thou canst not see. But let not thy spirit grow faint on account of the loud crying, for I am with thee, strengthening thee. So we're actually going to stop it there today, and we're going to pick up next week with chapter 17. This seems like a pretty good place to stop, because the next chapter is Abraham taught by the angels, utters the celestial song and prayers for enlightenment. And so we basically are going to leave it here with him traveling. We see him going on this very, very intense travel up into the celestial heavens where he's going to receive enlightenment or revelation and obviously he's going to see some prophecy as well so as always i hope that you guys enjoyed that please leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below again please remember to be respectful to each other as ram das says we are all literally just trying to walk each other home and figure out what has been taken from us as far as our knowledge of where we actually come from. Again, thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our opening song. If you would like to purchase the opening song, there is a link down in the description box below. And as always, thank you so much to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you all today. I hope that you're having a wonderful, wonderful week, and I will talk to you all very, very soon.